Good afternoon and welcome to the Iowa State the University Extension Dairy Team monthly webinar series. Uh, for those of you who are a regular part of it, you know that we have this archived and our uh, Dairy Team webpage and we invite you to be part of a survey uh, and I will send these links to you uh, after the conclusion of today's program. Uh, today's program uh, is one of those that uh, caught a lot of people's attention. Uh, what does 70% forage rations and 100 pounds of milk look like? Uh, presenting today is Dr. Carpenter. Uh, she's been with us at Iowa State since 2001 uh, as an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Animal Science and has worked at various capacities uh, on campus, including uh, being an interim uh, farm manager when we were between farm managers. She's also worked in the dairy industry uh, uh, literally uh, across two countries, uh, was in Canada for a while, and now is, uh, of course, uh, here in the Midwest. Uh, in addition, she started the Dairy Sci program, where students manage our Jersey herd at the Iowa State University Dairy Farm. Uh, Gail, we're excited to have you with us and presenting today. Uh, as I always say, the podium is yours. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Fred. And thank you, everybody, for being here with us this morning or afternoon or whatever time of day it is where you are. Um, I'm going to talk about what does 70% 70, 70 forage rations and 100 pounds of milk look like. And I appreciate uh, Timothy's comment here in the chat to equate the 100 pounds of milk to total solids per day. That's definitely something we're going to be addressing as well as we move forward. Um, I will also preface, especially since uh, Larry's here, Larry Trannel's with us today, I will preface and say this is not uh, for grazing dairies. Uh, for grazing dairies, 70% forage rations seems like nothing, but uh, so this is going to be for our confinement dairies more so. Um, but yeah, let's talk about what this can look like for herds. 70% forage rations and 100 pounds of milk. Maybe. There we go. So I'll start by saying, asking the question, why do we want to feed high forage diets? Uh, what is this interest coming from uh, where we're seeing a lot of renewed interest in high forage diets? We know from some survey work, uh, 2017 survey showed that feed industry professionals uh, reported that 91% of their herds increased forage feeding levels in the past five to 10 years, 10, sorry, 10 to 15 years. Uh, so it's definitely an area of interest that's growing in popularity. Uh, we just we know that homegrown feeds tend to be more cost effective. Now this is going to vary based on what grain prices are. So this is going to vary quite a bit as those markets go up and down. Uh, lately though, we're seeing that you know corn and soybeans are are expensive, and our, a lot of our concentrate feeds uh, are expensive, and these high feed costs are a struggle for a lot of farms. So being able to utilize our homegrown forages is a cost effective way in a lot of cases to increase our income over feed costs. And it, high forage diets can also promote the production of milk components if they're done right. Uh, we're able to do this right now because we can feed more forages uh, because they have been improving so much. And we'll talk about some of the uh, improvements that we've seen in forage uh, management and forage genetics in the past uh, several decades. But this was really the, the quantity of the forages that you feed on dairy farms. This, I'm going to come back to this concept quite a bit as I kind of uh, progress through the rest of this webinar. The quantity of forages that we're going to feed on dairy farms is going to be a combination of both forage quality and forage quantity. Um, so how much you can get away with feeding your cows is not just going to is going to depend on the quality of the forage. That's the first thing we think about, but also having an adequate forage inventory. So hopefully if we're doing this right, we're seeing a reduced feed cost as well as increased components. Uh, most of us are paid on components uh, and that's going to result in an improved income over feed costs. So a little bit of a case study here. So in the Northeast, I know we have somebody here from Maryland, so we're not all here today from the Midwest. Uh, the Northeast, these high forage rabbit rations tend to be a lot more common. 
Uh, so this was some just some uh, survey responses. So this isn't based on records. This isn't based on any uh, hard uh, quantifiable data. This is just what producers reported. Um, but I think that is still valuable and sometimes more valuable. Uh, producers, these 16 producers who were feeding high forage diets in this particular survey, they saw improved milk component levels, so they saw higher pounds of fat and protein, improved longevity in their herd, uh, more overall health, as well as improved income over feed costs. They also saw a reduction in acidosis, uh, foot health issues, calling rates, as well as veterinary costs overall. So definitely something that we can say a lot of producers are doing successfully. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the feed pyramid. Many of you will remember the food pyramid uh, from back in the 90s. And I don't know, it's like my plate now or something like that. I don't uh, I don't keep track of what that is now for, for humans. Uh, it used to be called the food pyramid back when I was growing up. Uh, but let's talk about a little bit about what that feed pyramid like, might look like for dairy producers. So this is a uh, feed pyramid uh, published in 1995. And you can see here, we got our feed additives here at the top, maybe the smaller levels of the feed additives, uh, fat supplements, bypass proteins, minerals and vitamins, obviously being closer to the top there. And then a lot of this bottom being taken up by the um, non-fiber carbohydrate feeds, grains and byproducts, as well as this room and degradable protein. And you see that forages and physical fiber, they are the bottom of the food pyramid. They still make up quite a bit of that uh, of that base of the feed pyramid, so important. Um, but what we've seen in the past several decades is, or couple decades, I should say, is really an increased emphasis on this, these forages, making sure that we're getting enough nutrients from these forages, the physical fiber that these forages provide, and they've become a much bigger, if you compare these two feed pyramids here, you've seen that forages have become a bigger component. Now, I ran across this paper published in 1969 when I was uh, getting ready for this, and this was uh, a symposium review. These two authors were arguing that we should decrease, we should not be feeding high forage diets. And this was again in the 60s, so maybe back at the time, things looked a little bit different and a lot of their arguments came down to some of the things that we're gonna be talking about today. The importance of forage quality, digestibility, and all that. And they actually, they said at one point, um, I pulled this quote here, if in the future conditions exist which indicate maximum forage feeding, it is possible that much of this forage may be quite different from that usually regarded as typical. So this is something, you know, in several years ago now, several decades ago, we were kind of looking at these forages as are they, they're limiting our digestibility to some extent and limiting the, the nutrients that cows can pull out of those rations. Uh, and now we're at a point where we're feeding much higher producing cows than we were back in the 60s and seeing that these forages have uh, changed quite a bit. They're not what they would have regarded as typical uh, back when this paper was written. So we as an industry have come quite a long way. A lot of the improvements in the NDF digestibility and fiber digestibility have provided additional information which help feed professionals uh, better utilize the higher forage levels and rations or high, higher levels of forage and rations. So our nutritionists and our feed professionals are better able to understand how to balance these high forage rations because we understand the chemistry of the plant better. But we've also seen quite a bit of improvements in forage genetics as well and just more digestible forages and, and higher energy forages overall. So I'm going to take a step and talk about some of these forage characteristics uh, that, again, have changed quite a bit and maybe aren't typical of what we used to see back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but some things have stayed the same uh, for as long as we've been studying them. And one of those things is, is the plant chemistry and the, the carbohydrates that we find in plants and forages. Uh, and you've seen maybe at some point in the past, I'm not going to go through all of this, but we know that our plant carbohydrates are generally broken into cell content carbohydrates and cell wall carbohydrates. Our cell wall carbohydrates are generally going to be our fibers, um, and our cell contents are generally going to be our more digestible, higher energy portion of the plant. So our starches, our sugars, versus the cell wall, that's where a lot of our fiber is. It gives structure to the plant, uh, and it allows the plant to, to grow uh, and to and to produce more yield. So we go back to the to basics, ADF, cellulose, and lignin, NDF, hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. I'm sure any of you who took an introductory uh, feeding course or any sort of nutrition course in college will recognize those terms. 
Um, but really, this gets a lot more a lot more nuanced than that. So there's been a lot of interest lately in, in characterizing the fiber digestibility of forages. And the way this is done is in vitro in the lab. Uh, so forage samples are collected, they're sent to your lab of choice and uh, degraded in these or digested in vitro in these labs. And what they do is they put them in, put them in anaerobic conditions, they ferment them, and they let them sit for a period of time. And if you take a look here on our y axis, this is the percent of the fiber remaining, there's a lag period. Uh, while the forage uh, begins to ferment before the, for the fiber begins to disappear. After that lag period, there's some rapid disappearance. Uh, and you can see that the, the rate of disappearance is quite high, and that eventually will taper off and, be, and disappear more slowly. So we tend to call this a fast fraction and a slow fraction. So the more rapidly degraded fiber and the more slowly degraded fiber, those both occur oftentimes within the same plant even. And so the relationship between the fast and slow fractions can be an important thing to consider when your nutritionist is balancing your rations. We look at uh, NDFD or NDF digestibility. We could we can measure at several different time points. Some of the time points that you might see NDFD measured at would be 24, 30, or 48 hours. Uh, really, 30 hours seems to be a really good measurement of how fast these fibers are going to digest. Uh, and so an NDFD 30 is going to be a good uh, indicator of how fast um, of how fast the fiber is digesting. However, uh, you might see 48 hours sometimes uh, as well. And the important thing would be uh, even if 30 hours might be preferred, but make sure that you're not measuring some of your forages at 38 hour or 30 hours and some of them at 48 hours. Make sure if you're comparing your your haylages or your corn silages or, or anything else if you're measuring ndfd side by side and directly comparing make sure that you are focusing on um, using just one of those time points and then what what's done in the lab uh, is they this this forage is continued to ferment sorry my pointer disappeared there this forage continues to ferment uh, for 240 hours that's 10 days now in the rumen, most forages aren't gonna stay in the rumen for 10 days, um, but for the sake of lab analysis, they basically just ferment them as long as possible. They hold them in there um, until all the fiber that would possibly disappear would disappear. So anything that is uh, has disappeared before 240 hours, we consider as available for digestion. And anything that has not disappeared after 240 hours is not going to be available digestion. It's not going to provide any nutrients or energy to the cow. Now, between different forages, you might see differences in, in we call this UNDFD, so un, uh, undegraded NDF at 240 hours. So if you see that number UNDF 240, that refers to uh, this remaining fiber after 240 hours of digestion. Um, I find that, uh, especially when it comes to fiber and carbohydrates and and uh, some of those aspects of nutrition, that um, it tends to look like alphabet soup after a while. So uh, we throw a lot of these uh, acronyms around, but UNDFD 240 is going to refer to that um, remaining fiber after 240 hours of digestion. Now, if we compare these two uh, uh, hypothetical forages right here, you can see that one of them has dramatically different remaining UNDF uh, after 240 hours of digestion. And that really has a big impact on the overall quality of that forage. So that's one thing that, that can really impact the ability of the cow to be able to use that forage. In fact, for every 1% increase in UNDF D240, you're gonna see a 0.84 pound decrease in dry matter intake. And we know that dry matter intake is directly related to milk production. And so um, this can be a very limiting factor of forages and a really important measurement of forage quality. Another forage characteristic that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is physically effective fiber. Uh, that's usually measured um, with this Penn State particle separator. Uh, you can see some recommendations from Miner Institute here for the Penn State particle separator. So we know that forage, as in the ruminant, forage provides energy from the digestion of that NDF, but it also has a physical effect. So it, uh, it sloughs the rumen wall, it provides a rumen mat, it provides a, an ecosystem for those rumen bacteria to grow. Um, so the physically infective fiber component of that forage is going to be really important uh, in making sure that that 
it's doing it's it's playing its role in the in the diet of the cow. Now, forage feeding and the, how high we're able to go in forage diets can really be dictated by NDF intake, uh, as well as the digestibility of that NDF. So not just just looking at total NDF is a useful tool, um, but it shouldn't be the only tool we use. Uh, so measurements like UNDF to D240 are also really important uh, for for measuring our forage quality and for balancing the rations that have high forage diets. Generally, uh, based on some data that Mertens has published, we assume that total NDF intake uh, from forages and from non forages is about 1.1 to 1.2% of a cow's body weight. However, there is some field data that suggests this is this can go higher. So we've seen reports even uh, from the northeast of, of diets that have gone even higher than 1.4% of body weight NDF. Um, but this has to really come from that highly digestible forage. So that has to come from forage that's providing a very digestible uh, form of fiber. At 75% of NDF from forage, that's going to equate um, to about 0.9% of a cow's body weight. Uh, and so you can see some math right here. Um, if your forage uh, NDF is 50% uh, and we're looking at about 0.9% uh, of body weight, that's going to equate to about 27 pounds of forage. Uh, I'm not going to walk through the math right here, but the main point that I want to bring home is that this total NDF, uh, it provides, if it's digestible, um, it can, uh, it provides energy, but it's still, even digestible fiber is going to um, provide some level of rumen fill. Uh, so it's definitely a balancing act that we have to go through when we're looking at feeding a high forage diet and the forages that we choose. Uh, so another note that I want to make here is that um, if we're using this example cow, she's 1,500 pounds of body weight, First lactation cows are going to be smaller than your older cows, and so they're going to be more limited in rumen fill compared to the multiparous cows or cows in their second, third, fourth lactation. Um, so this is a good reason. Um, I really recommend if, it, if it's possible in your facilities to house first lactation cows separately, to put first lactation cows in a different pen, especially uh, in earlier lactation or around peak milk. Um, and this would be another reason that it's a good idea to do that. We can use additives to improve the overall digestibility of our forages. Uh, so a couple additives that and I know there's a lot of a lot of additives that are sold out there. So, of course, I think we have to be careful on um, there's a tendency sometimes to just put a lot of uh, put a lot of stuff into the ration that's all supposed to give you a half a pound of milk here, half a pound of milk there. Uh, at a certain point, not all of it's proven. And at a certain point, you're going to see a uh, declining returns on in, in, uh adding more additives. A couple that I really highly recommend, though, that I think are proven and that have been shown to have a uh, solid impact on that fiber digestibility and rumen health, health would be sugar. Um, so sugar is an energy source for those fiber digesting bacteria. Uh, sugar, the, the bacteria that break down the fiber in a diet really need sugar for an energy source as well. So if we provide extra sugar in the diet, that allows those uh, bacteria to break down more fiber. Um, and so really we recommend this, a meta-analysis published a few years ago now shows that around that 6.75 to 7.5 percent of dry, dry matter really helps um, peak that fiber digestibility and that equates to about a pound and a half to two pounds of sugar. I'm not suggesting going to the grocery store and grabbing a couple bags of sugar and throwing them in your mixer, um, but this can come from different sources. So some of it will come from the forages itself. Um, this is also something you'll often find in molasses or a lot of different liquid feed supplements. Direct fed microbials such as yeast are also shown to improve rumen health and improve fiber digestibility. And then using things like uh, like binders, um, especially if you're having a toxin issue in your forages, those can be a, a useful insurance plan uh, to make to uh, make sure that we're getting the most out of our um, our silage, as well as TMR preservatives can be used sometimes. Um, if you're using a TMR preservative, that can be useful if you're finding that you know, your, your um, TMR is heating up at the bunk uh, or you're having other issues, but really rather than rely on these preservatives, I suggest um, we don't want to have to rely on them year after year. So if uh, if it's something that that year after year we're having to incorporate these to make sure that we're, we're not overheating our feet at the bunk, it's time to take a look at our overall silage management and take Yeah, 
this might seem like a little, kind of weird question here, but but what is corn silage? Uh, corn silage is a tricky one, especially when we're talking about forages, right? Um, so we're talking about here, 70% uh, forage ration. Uh, we're here in the Midwest, and so a lot of our rations are based on corn silage. Corn silage is going to be the most common ingredient in most of our rations that we see out here, uh, especially in confinement herds, again, like I said. So what is it? Is it a forage? Uh, it's a little bit tricky because it's part grain and part forage. So you know that the corn plant uh, and the leaves and the, and the stem here, those are definitely forage-like components. But then we're putting the whole plant in, so a lot of this grain ends up in the for in the silage as well. Um, so if you're putting it into a software, a ration balancing software, and that software is kicking out um, the percent forage in the diet that you're feeding, it's going to consider it 100% forage. But really, it's going to be a little bit of both, a little bit of forage and a little bit of grain. So if we consider, uh, if you look at look up high corn silage diets, those are also going to be high forage diets because Corn silage is going to be our, our main forage in a lot of our Midwest rations. So most of our high forage diets are going to use uh, corn silage as the primary forage source. And so this is why it's really important to consider not just the percent forage in the ration. Don't stop with thinking it just as percent forage, but also forage NDF. Uh, so what is the actual fiber that is provided by this plant here? Um, so as we're feeding uh, lower NDF forages, that can translate a lot of times to a higher forage diet. So that begs the next question. If this is a if, if the corn silage is not providing as much NDF, if the forage, if the corn silage is not providing as much of the components that we consider traditional forage components and is providing more starch, and high corn silage diets are high forage diets, can too much forage actually hurt rumen health? So we talk about high forage diets as promoting rumen health, but is it possible that you can have so much forage in the form of corn silage that rumen health is ultimately harmed? And the answer to that is yes. So this is an example ration here. This is not a real ration. In fact, there's nothing in this protein mix. Um, so this isn't a real ration. Don't go feeding it at home. But it is kind of an example of, of a, a typical high corn silage, uh, high forage diet that you might see. This is a 70% forage example ration. And in this case, it is a high corn silage ration. And uh, this equates to 31% starch and about 20% PENDF. So really high start, even though it's high forage, it's very high starch and pretty low on NDF. Um, and so this would be a red flag for me if I was looking at this ration in terms of, of overall room and health. Uh, and you can see here, most of the starch in this diet is actually being contributed. We're feeding some high moisture corn in here, but most of this, uh, most of the starch in this example diet is being contributed by corn silage. So there's definitely, it kind of comes back to that balancing act. You can actually harm rumen health with too much corn silage or starch, or uh, if we go the other way and we're feeding too much um, of our other forages that, that are maybe less digestible or higher in NDF, we can uh, limit intake and, and with rumen fill if we're feeding lower digestibility or higher NDF forages. So this is definitely a balancing act. And when we ask what uh, what a 70% forage diet is going to look like uh, and 100 pounds of milk, the answer is going to be uh, it's going to basically come down to good management. Uh, so Jeff asked, how about a high NDF forage like forage sorghum that has a high NDFD and lower energy to balance the corn silage energy? Jeff, I love it. You're kind of uh, sneaking ahead of me a little bit here. I am going to uh, talk about some of these other forages as well and how they can fit in. Definitely a lot of our alternative forages um, and even our even things like grasses, those can definitely balance out the higher corn silage diets. It's still important with these uh, high NDF alternative forages to make sure that that forage is digestible and that we're not feeding too much of that UNDF 240 just to make sure that we are um, just to make sure that we're not limiting rumen fill, but definitely there is a place for a lot of these uh, alternative forages and higher NDF forages in diets. Um, especially, uh, we can really start getting uh, um, really start getting nuanced about this if we talk about different groups that we're feeding. Um, 
So for example, if you have a forage sorghum that's higher NDF, but maybe the digestibility, maybe it's not a BMR, you know, maybe the high digestibility is a little bit lower, that can be a really great feed for our low producing cows or our heifers as well. So um, we only have uh, about an hour here, so um, can't get into all of the nuances of that, but that what that looks like on every single farm, but definitely that's something that can be incorporated into high forage diets. Yeah, next time. <laughs> So some keys for success. Uh, one of my favorite things to say is you can't outfeed bad management. Um, and I think when we're talking about feeding these higher forage diets, that's a really key take home point. So the first key for success when it comes to feeding high forage diets and what that 70% forage and 100 pounds can look like is making sure we're feeding lots. We have lots of inventory and that inventory is high quality. So the inventory can be a bottleneck for a lot of herds that want to transition to a higher forage uh, diet. Uh, if you don't have enough space to put up those forages or to store those forages pop properly, that can be a pretty big bottleneck for a, a lot of herds. And then we really want to focus on that forage being good quality. A lot of this is going to, a lot of my nutritional recommendations just boil down to having happy cows and happy rumens. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then also uh, another bottleneck for a lot of herds can be reproduction. So if our cows are not low enough days in milk, that is gonna be a bottleneck for a lot of herds as well. And I'll talk about some best practices around that later. And that back to Timothy's first point uh, at the beginning of this webinar, uh, I wanna give honorable mention to one of the keys for success when we are talking about feeding high forage rations and having high production is to shift your perspective from those that pounds of milk to pounds of solids. Most of us are paid on solids. And so this is something that's really paying our bills more so than, than shipping 100 pounds of milk. Uh, and so I want to I wanna talk about that here for a sec. So here's some example rations. This is from a little bit older now. It's about uh, oh, 10 years old, um, 2013. So these were some uh, examples of herds in the Northeast feeding some of these higher forage diets. You can see some of the um, some of the forage characteristics and, and ration characteristics down here. But really what I want to focus on is these first three lines. So the milk, pounds of milk per day, milk fat, and milk true protein. So if we take a look along the top here, you see these herds, they're all feeding high forage diets. Uh, these range from, uh, the percent of forage ranges from 62 to, or yeah, around 60 to around 75 even. Um, and you can see that milk production varies a lot from, from 105 pounds to 90 pounds to 88 pounds, uh, this herd 76 pounds. So a lot of variation here. Uh, if I convert this though to pounds of fat and protein, um, looking at the combined fat and protein of these herds, I have uh, I have three herds here that are milking six and a half pounds of solids. Um, and the big difference between, and these herds that are milking six and a half pounds of solids range from 88 pounds to 100 pounds. So this 100 pound herd down here uh, is only averaging a 3.6 fat and a 2.9 protein compared to this herd milking 30, 88 pounds that's milking a 4.3 fat and a 3.1 protein. Um, so really I'd challenge you to shift your perspective um, and let's stop thinking, and I'm still gonna refer to pounds of milk. I'm, I'm gonna be just as guilty as the rest of us probably. Um, but I think it's time for us as an industry to kind of shift that paradigm and start stop talking as much about pounds of milk or volume of milk being shipped. Talk about those pounds of components being shipped. So a key here, like I said, is going to be a uh, good quality forage and lots of it. Um, so the inventory is going to be key as well. Um, and the same 2017 survey that I talked about earlier, um, when they asked producers why, what was limiting them on feeding higher forage than they were already, was the forage quality and this forage inventory. So you need a place to put it. Not only are you going to be feeding a higher percent of forage in your diets, but that is uh, high forage diets can actually increase a cow's dry matter intake. So ultimately you could be looking at needing space to, to almost a third more um, forage than you're already uh, storing right now. And a lot of herds are already maybe struggling with the, with the space for forage storage. I know we are here at our Iowa State Dairy. We're running out of places to stash forage. And so this can be something that limits um, a lot of herds. Regular forage analysis is going to be really important um, and making sure that we're measuring dry matter intake in particular and staying in tune with those dry matter changes. 
Another struggle that a lot of farms might experience is TMR mixer management. Um, so the diets may be fluffier. Uh, so if you take a look here uh, at this example, um, this was uh, again at our university herd, so I can pick on it a little bit. Um, some some of this hay that didn't uh, didn't make it into the, they maybe overloaded the mixer, didn't get the hay quite in the mixer there. Uh, one of the things that uh, that you find when you're switching to a higher forage diet is going to be it's just bulkier. It just takes a lot more physical space. It's a fluffier um, diet. So we may need a bigger mixer, more mixers. It's really important to be on top of that maintenance schedule for that TMR mixer. Um, so this is another thing that we can't, another practical thing that you can't just forget about if you're trying to move to a higher forage diet. And then feed hygiene is really critical too, especially during harvest, making sure that we're not getting contamination with dirt or mud um, that can cause molds, yeast, fungi issues in the feed. Um, and so paying attention to feed hygiene during harvest is an important uh, part of this as well. Feeding high quality forages. Again, we've, done, we've actually done a webinar series on this already. So I encourage you to go check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, but some uh, some things to take home regarding high quality forages. Uh, corn silage, whew, we could spend hours talking about this, but I'm gonna just give a couple of reminders right here on high quality corn silage. Kernel processing, uh, kernel processing, we're at the phase now in the industry that uh, that's, not really, that's not really optional anymore, I don't think. Uh, we know that it has a, a benefit. We know how to do kernel processing um, from an engineering perspective, uh, so much better. Um, so kernel processing is really gonna be key for getting the most benefit out of your corn silage. Um, using inoculants, using a Buchner eye inoculant, I think is, uh, is best practice for corn silage. Um, and, uh, and not going too crazy with those, but definitely looking at a Buchner eye is, is beneficial for that long-term storage and making sure that your feed out um, is uh, making sure that you're not getting spoilage during feed out. And then don't skip on these other best practices. So, you know, the packing, the covering, the all of the all of the things that we talk about going into really good quality corn silage, don't skimp out on those. Um, that's not a time to cut corners. That's not a time to, uh, uh, you know, let things slide. Corn silage happens once a year and it provides that even if you're not feeding a 70% forage diet, uh, once a year, you get the chance to harvest the feed that makes up the majority of your rations for and that's going to pay the bills for the rest of the year. So this is not the time to be cutting corners. We also have uh, haze and haylages. Um, so looking at the timeliness of the harvest, and I want to emphasize here that when I talk about timeliness of harvest, uh, Maturity uh, is going to be the key thing that we look at, not the calendar date. So if you plant something that's supposed to be har you can harvest by Memorial Day, don't just say, hey, it's Memorial Day on my calendar. Uh, take a look, be sure to, to monitor the maturity of that, of that plant. Um, just overall attention to detail. Again, not skimping on those best practices. Grasses or other, um, grasses or other uh, uh, high NDF, uh, forages, like we talked about some of these alternative forages, uh, grasses, cocktail mixes, these can be great to balance starch in the corn silage. Um, so these can be great additions to a high corn silage diet. Um, and then for alfalfa, again, making sure that you're uh, harvesting at the appropriate time. We have a tool here. This link is not active right now because it's February, or no, it's not February anymore. It's March. Um, but, uh, it's March in Iowa, and so we're not, we don't have alfalfa out right now, um, but this is a tool to, to monitor peak, uh, which, which is an indicator of, um, of alfalfa maturity. Um, so paying attention to, uh, we have some resources here in the state of Iowa um, where this is tested around the state or measured around the state to help you kind of keep track of where your neighbors are at. Um, and then we have some great fact sheets available as well for how to, how to measure peak in alfalfa. Spring harvested cover crops in particular can be really highly digestible forages. This can be rocket fuel for cows sometimes. Um, and again, I'd really encourage you to check out that. We have a, a video from this past summer talking about some uh, cover crops uh, and, uh, and using these in diets. Uh, these can be really highly digestible forages and great additions to a high forage diet plan. Um, if you're harvesting in spring, of course, there's some balancing act there as well. You're going to have to balance against potentially delaying your corn silage planting. And in wet springs, this can be a particular challenge, especially in this part of the Midwest. So all of these come with a grain of salt, um, but these can all be uh, high quality forages are going to be what you need 
to make corn silage diets work or high, high forage diets work. Now, what about, we might be thinking about some of our alternative hybrids or, or different hybrids that uh, for, um, uh, for alfalfa and corn silage in particular. So, you know, you've heard uh, corn silage and alfalfa called the king and queen of forages. Um, and we've made a lot of advancements recently in terms of the digestibility. And we have particular hybrids that may be more, um, that are more digestible and have more availability in that fiber uh, than, our, than our traditional hybrids might. Uh, so reduced lignin alfalfa, uh, you've probably seen a fair amount about that. Um, again, not to go into a ton of detail for sake of time here, uh, but with reduced lignin alfalfa, that can be a great addition to a lot of forage programs. The benefit from reduced lignin alfalfa, in my opinion, is going to come more from this flexible harvest window. Uh, so you get one or the other, right? You can, you can harvest every 28 days. You know, you can stay on that same har uh, cutting schedule. Um, and get the benefit of the lower lignin, improved digestibility. But a lot of the benefit from this reduced lignin alfalfa is going to come from the fact that it can stay out longer. You're not going to sacrifice the quality if it if you don't cut it every 28 days, if you let it mature a little bit more. Um, so giving a little bit of flexibility in that harvest window is a really great benefit of this reduced lignin alfalfa. BMR corn silage, another great tool. Um, we definitely see improved digestibility with BMR. However, another thing that we see with these hybrids is that they do have lower yields um, and the plant is overall just less hardy. So the fiber and um, the fiber that we feed to cows is actually serves a purpose to the forages themselves and to the plant itself. Uh, so it provides structure, it provides strength to that plant. And if we're taking some of that away, uh, it makes those plants just less able to grow as, as large. Uh, and so that reduces our yield. And then the plants themselves tend to be less hardy um, and and don't um maybe don't have the standability uh so making sure if you're using bmr uh using it on the most fertile and well-drained soils the other uh we don't really recommend feeding bmr to the whole herd uh, most of the benefit that you're going to see with feeding bmr is going to come if you're using it in your transition cows so specifically those pre-fresh cows that three weeks before calving to about three or four weeks after calving Though it's going to be the the window where you're going to get the most benefit from that BMR. However, especially for smaller farms, there's a lot of challenges that can come from that as well. So if you're just feeding it to a subset of uh, to two different smaller groups on your herd, um, that's going to require that you have two bunkers open at the same time, and all of the issues that come with face management, you know, having having so many inches of feed out a day, um, making sure that face is well maintained. All of those issues um, are going to be basically doubled if you're feeding two different types of corn silage at the same time. So it definitely can be a challenge to a lot of herds. You're not going to hurt other cows if you're feeding BMR to other groups. If you're feeding BMR to your high cows, your late lactation cows, you can feed BMR to, to, to everybody. Uh, but um, really, when you're going to get the highest impact on um, that higher digestibility of that corn silage is going to be in these high risk groups here, the pre fresh and the fresh cows. So can you feed both? Can you feed reduced lignin alfalfa and uh, BMR corn silage? Can we get double benefits by feeding both of these more digestible hybrids from the different forages? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, but really, as you're, you know, fiber can become too digestible after a certain point. And so we really want to make sure that we're watching the rumination, making sure cows are still chewing their, their cud. Uh, that's something we can visualize. You know, if you're just walking a herd, making sure that you're walking around, at least half of those cows are cud chewing. Um, if you have rumination monitors, that's another great tool to keep an eye on that. Um, and of course, watch manure as well. Um, so making sure that we're not seeing a lot of loose manure, that we're still seeing, um, that we're still seeing good manure, good manure scores, the cows will tell you if it's working or not. Um, so if you decide to, to use both um, and you're kind of pushing some of that NDFD, uh, seem to be getting you some background noise. It's, um, it's uh, uh, we're having an external uh, advisory review today. And so there's a, there's a party happening outside my door. I apologize for the background noise there. If you need me to clarify anything, um, please let me know. Um, I got a new microphone and apparently it's better at picking up sound than I thought it was. Um, so uh, 
If you need me to repeat anything or clarify, uh, please give me a heads up. So uh, the, the next key to success here, like I said, is going to come from happy cows and happy brumens. Our biggest uh, recommendation when it comes to uh, improving components and feedings for increased components, whether that's fat or protein, that's going to come from making sure our rumen health is where it needs to be. So keeping that rumen happy, keeping that rumen health where it needs to be, that is what's ultimately going to increase our components. One of the tools that we have to measure this on farm is milk fatty acids. Uh, so we can, uh, fatty acids can break into a couple different groups, uh, either preformed um, or dietary fatty acids. So preformed fatty acids are going to be the acids that the cow actually consumes from the diet itself. And then de novo fatty acids are fatty acids that the cow makes on her own in the mammary gland. So milk fat can come from these two different sources. We also refer to mixed fatty acids. Um, and those are, we, we decide if it's preformed or de novo based on the chain length of those fatty acids. And so those fatty acids that are kind of in the middle between the two on chain length, we refer to as mixed fatty acids. That's just because we can't really know where they came from. Um, so these de novo fats are really strongly correlated to milk fat production. Uh, and so there's been a lot of research showing that if we increase the, the number of, if we have higher levels of these de novo fats, the fats that the cow actually produces herself in the mammary gland, uh, that is related to higher milk fat. That is also, um, so there's a strong correlation from de novos to milk fat. Uh, you see here we have some targets. This is uh, some targets for um, de novo fatty acid production. Um, increasing de novos uh, and increasing, uh, in getting more of those de novo fats that are correlated to the higher overall milk fat. That comes from having good rumen, rumen fermentation as well as high VFA production. Um, so VFA production, volatile fatty acids in the rumen, that comes from a healthy rumen. So the, the healthier we get that rumen, the more we optimize that fermentation in the rumen, the better our overall, um, the better our overall milk fat production is. It, it allows the cow to make more of those fats on her own. There's a couple of different things that we've seen. Um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail here in a sec, but a couple different things that we know are proven to increase those de novos don't necessarily come from the ration itself. We're feeding anything special or, or balancing the ration in a specific way. A lot of it comes from decreased stocking density, cow comfort, and optimizing feed intake, which can be nutritional. It can come from the ration, but it can also come from feed management. And it also has a strong relationship uh, to milk protein as well. Um, so if we're talking about improving our overall solids, not just the milk fat, but also the milk protein, um, making sure that we're getting optimal rumen fermentation is the first step when it comes to improving our milk protein as well. So this is a, an abstract that was published in ADSA, uh, the American Dairy Science Association a couple years ago now. Um, but basically they, they were able to show in these abstracts that uh, they were looking at cows with at risk for subacute ruminal acidosis. And they found that stocking density was actually a higher predictor, uh, had more of an impact on cows that had subacute ruminal acidosis or the, the cows that were likely to get subacute ruminal acidosis. Being overstocked was a bigger risk factor in this particular case than the diet itself was. And since we think of Sarah as a dietary, um, a dietary issue, this is kind of surprising, at least it was to me, uh, to see that, that actually this management factor is what's going to play a bigger role than the diet that you're feeding itself. And these are a couple papers, I won't get into all the details here, but a couple papers published in the Journal of Dairy Science uh, out of um, Minor Institute in Cornell. So again, looking mostly at the Northeast there. These were farms from New York and Vermont, uh, and they found farms with either high or low bulk tank de novo fatty acids. Um, so uh, so, so they, this was field data. Uh, they, they, they tested de novos on about a bunch of bulk tanks in different farms and then classified them as either having high de novo fatty acid production or low de novo fatty acids. And they found, again, stocking density to be a really big indicator of um, the level of de novos in those, in those bulk tanks, which again is correlated to higher fat. Um, so these herds with high, uh, high de novo fatty acid production they were at about 105% stocking density, 1.05 cows per stall, 
versus low de novo herds tended to have 120, a little bit, not, not incredibly overstocked, um, but more overstocked than the herds with higher de novo production. They also found that these herds were more likely to deliver feed twice a day instead of once a day, to keep stocking density low, and to provide at least 18 inches of bunk space. Um, so making sure that they uh, provided adequate bunk space um, uh, so that cows were able to access the feed bunk. So management is going to be a key thing for those healthy rumens. Uh, so some general, and this is not an exhaustive list here, so some other reminders for having happy and healthy rumens. Uh, stay on top of those feed changes. Pay attention to dry matter. Uh, make sure your feeders have uh, know how many cows are in each pen uh, using a TMR tracker or, or whatever feed management software you have, making sure that that's updated so that um, feeders have accurate uh, uh, cow numbers when they're mixing rations. Um, paying attention to weather and how that might impact the dry matter of your forages. Do not let cows run out of feed if you're trying to feed a high forage diet. Um, they're going to spend more time eating uh, because that because it just it takes more physical time for them to chew to eat that forage. They're going to spend more time up at the feed bunk, and so we want to make sure that they have access to feed um, as many hours of the day as possible. Again, silage face management, a lot of those basics, aerobic stability, making sure that that we're not getting spoilage at the at the silage bunk, palatability, delivery of feed, all of these feed management practices really tie back into making sure that that we're optimizing um, our cow comfort here. Again, uh, there's more time spent eating with these higher forage diet, dry matter intake may increase like we talked about earlier. In the summer, we want to make sure the cows have fresh feed and that we're paying attention to making sure that feed isn't reheating in the bunk. Making sure there's frequent feed push ups so making sure that cows that feed isn't just in front of cows at all times, but is in reach of cows at all times. Uh, so making sure that they're not that, that the feed is, is accessible to cows. Um, making sure that we're allowing for but also promoting resting time. So making sure cows have access to the feed bunk, but also that they're comfortable getting rest time when they need that. Um, this can relate again to that issue of stocking density, limiting the time in the holding pen, making sure they're not in the holding pen for more than an hour a day, as well as that overall cow comfort, making sure our stalls are sized properly, making sure we have good bedding, etc. Making sure cows have access to clean water. Uh, again, I'm going to come back to this question of separating the first lactation cows. Um, I think that that uh, from a from a room and fill standpoint is important, but also from a social stress standpoint, making sure that those cows aren't having to fight with the older cows to get their way to the feed bunk. If we're setting those first lactation cows up for success, we're setting them up for lifetime success as well. Um, so if your facilities allow for it, I, I really recommend trying to have a separate group for your for your first lactation cows. Now, another bottleneck that I don't know if anybody expected to hear about in a nutrition presentation, um, but a lot of times uh, the common bottleneck that we see for cows that can't meet that level of production that they want to see, whether that's a high forage diet or, or otherwise, a common bottleneck is going to be lowering those days in milk. So if we take a look at the lactation curves here, if we have too many cows that are out here on the lactation curve, we really want to be moving our average closer to that peak milk. Um, so making sure that we're lowering our days in milk by improving our reproductive programs. And to me, the first two things I look at when I'm uh, when a herd has this bottleneck of days in milk, a couple things I'm going to look at are protocol compliance and also how healthy is that transition period? How well are those transition cows transitioning after calving? So protocol compliance is a big thing that's going to tie in with lower days in milk, especially on farms that are using synchronization programs. Here's a couple examples. These are just demonstration herds and dairy comp. These are just a couple of the dairy comp herds that come with the program. But you can see a couple of different examples here of a herd with with pretty good. They're using an off sync program for first service. They have you can see a nice tight distribution. Uh, in days and milk at first breeding. Um, a few outliers here, but overall some pretty decent protocol compliance on this herd versus this herd right here that's not getting some of these cows bred until past 200 days in milk. Um, making uh, lowering days in milk the first place you're going to need to look if you don't have your, your preg rate on your days in milk where you want them to be. The first place um, I like to start looking is when are cows getting bred? When are cows getting shots? Are they getting are are the stated protocols on paper being followed 
cows can't read uh they don't know what your protocols are they don't know when they're supposed to be getting shots they don't follow the book unless you are actually um following the protocols that you set out so protocol compliance and lowering those days in milk is really important for having success with these high forage diets and high producing cows and then of course having a healthy transition period and again this is another thing that we could talk for hours about so i'm definitely uh, abbreviating for sake of time um, the transition period uh, of course we know that that's the first three weeks before calving and the three weeks after calving as uh, as somebody in nutrition we spend a lot of time talking about pre-fresh diets and fresh diets and looking at the actual feed and rations of these transition cows um, but at least in in my circles that i talk in um in, in nutrition circles we tend to kind of skip over this big event that happens between pre-fresh and fresh and that's calving um, so maternity management is also incredibly important in making sure that cows have a healthy transition so the diets you can you can spend all the time you want getting a perfect perfect decad on your fresh cows making sure your urine phs are right making sure um, that your pre-fresh cows are getting the exact perfect diet that you want um, but if we're falling short on our maternity management if we're having um, issues with hygiene, cleanliness, uh, if you're having issues with calf health and mortality, that can be a good indicator that your maternity management uh, program might need some help as well. Um, but if you're not setting that calf up for success in her lifetime, you're probably also not setting that cow up for success in the rest of her lactation. So I don't want to under underemphasize how important that actual maternity management can be for making sure those cows have a proper transition. We know that um, problems with maternity management with cleanliness in particular can cause problems with metritis. Problems with metritis can in turn cause problems with preg rate, conception rate, not getting cows to breed back in time. That can lengthen our average days in milk of a herd. And that's just gonna be a bottleneck for the herd. That's gonna, that's gonna uh, limit us really on how much milk we can produce. And again, that can be on a 70% forage diet. It can be on a 50% forage diet. But it's an important reminder, I think, especially when you're getting to these higher forage diets, everything needs to be dialed in. Um, and so everything you're doing, uh, you need to be making sure you're doing it extra to make sure those high forage diets can be a success. So again, a non-exhaustive list of think things to think about in that transition period. Uh, in the dry period, we can be thinking about housing, our grouping strategies, our stocking density, nutritional strategies, how long cows are dry, how many days they're in close up. These are all things to consider when we're finding a transition cow um, program that works on our herd. Uh, maternity, again, don't want to underemphasize the importance of the maternity management, cleanliness, uh, management of those cows. What does your calf health look like, calf, early calf mortality look like? And then fresh period, again, uh, housing, grouping strategies, stocking density, diet, um, are events being recorded? How are fresh cows being monitored? These are all things to consider. A transition cow program is gonna look different on every single herd you walk onto, um, but these are all things to think about when we're trying to optimize our transition cow protocols. Um, so there's two things that I like to see when I'm talking about dry cow nutrition. I don't wanna see fat cows and I wanna make sure cows have access to feed. Um, and this maximizing feed intake, that can be physical access to feed. That can also be the diet itself that you're feeding. So we can feed diets uh, to pre-fresh cows in particular that can limit their dry matter intake, either too high starch or um, too much antibiotic salts. There's a bunch of different ways that we can limit um, inc uh, limit the, how much the cows want to eat in addition uh, to making sure that they actually have access to feed at all times. So again, you go on to a bunch of different farms, you're going to see you go on to 100 farms, you're going to see 100 different ways to feed dry cows. Um, there's a lot of recommendations for dry cows out there. To me, this all of the recommendations boil down to no fat cows and make sure they're eating what they need to eat. Dry cow facilities, same story, lots of variation, lots of recommendations, lots of right ways to get this done. The things that the right, uh, the right way, quote unquote, the things that all of those right ways have in common is that cows have room to eat, they have a place to rest, they have good heat abatement. I know we're not really thinking about that right now. It's March 1, uh, so we're maybe not thinking a lot about heat abatement right now, but incredibly important even for dry cows um, for lactation success and then limiting the social stress of those cows as much as we can. 
And then finally, um, make sure this is kind of that that um, bridge between nutrition and, and facilities and management, making sure that cows were prioritizing feed access for those cows. Um, if we have 30 inches of bunk space, we might be able to get away with going 100% stocking density. If we have less than 30 inches, we probably want to understock those pre-fresh pens, making sure feed's put up and and feeding it, making sure that they have fresh, fresh, fresh feed in front of them. Now, I've kind of spent a lot of time uh, talking about what things are going to look like in a perfect world. Uh, so uh, you might be thinking to yourself that that all sounds great, um, but you're sitting in a cushy office up in your ivory tower, and that's not how things work in reality. Uh, so, yes, I want to take some time to address that uh, things happen that are not that are frustrating and uh, we can't control a lot of things. There's as much as we try to control, as much as we adhere to those best practices, really do our best when it comes to forage management there's a it's a less than perfect world out there so um so yeah there are definitely still going to be times when reality kind of steps in um and really the question to ask you yourself is what is right for my farm and i trying to get the 70 percent forage diet just because it seems like the hip thing to do i saw a webinar about it uh my buddies are doing it everybody out in the northeast is doing it um Really think about what the goals are for your farm, what the capabilities are for your farm, um, and and think about what's right for your situation. A couple different uh, considerations for when things are not ideal. Uh, first of all, feed allocation. We talked about this a little bit earlier, forage allocation. Any forage can be useful, unless it's really gross. So if it's got a lot of spoilage, um, mold, uh, anything like that, if it's, if it's toxic, then don't feed it. Uh, but uh, any forage, assuming it's not gross, any forage on farm can be useful, either for heifers, uh, for dry cows, for low producing cows. Um, don't assume that all of your forage that you, that you um, harvest is going to be high quality. Make sure that lower quality forage is used effectively. In fact, and specifically as we're talking about raising heifers, we might actually, um, we might actually decide, in most cases, you don't want too much digestibility for your heifers. You don't want the heifers to get high quality. You don't want the heifers to get the, the really high energy uh, diets. So um, having some of those lower quality forages, like we talked about, those can balance out some of your high starch and your corn silage, but they can also be really important to use um, for some of your animals that aren't needing the rocket fuel like your high producing cows are. Also think about what other forages are available. Um, so these alternative forages, we talked about sorghum earlier, um, cocktail mixes are becoming a lot more popular, using cover crops we talked about a little bit, um, and different different cover crops might work differently into different cop cropping system, different cocktail mixes might. There's, again, we've done some, some uh, we've done some webinars about this, so I encourage you to go check out our YouTube channel if that's something that interests you. Um, but there's a lot, we call corn silage and alfalfa the king and queen of forages, um, but they are not the only forages out there. There's a lot of forages that can fit really well into a high forage um, management system. And then what happens if we're in drought? What happens if our forages are actually short? We're short, or we have forage shortage. Uh, uh, it might be time, you know, again, to feed that 70% forage diet. That's gonna need a lot of inventory. And a bottleneck many years can be um, uh, the actual structure that you have in place to be able to store forages. Um, but maybe some the bottleneck other years might be drought, might be a shortage of yield. Um, and so giving yourself the grace to be able to say, you know what, maybe I'm not going to be able to feed a 70% forage diet. Feeding higher grains might be what you need to do in those years. Um, but high fiber bride products can also make a really great addition to, to um diets to provide some of that roughage. It's not roughage per se. Um, it's going to not have the same physically effective fiber. Um, but in some years, these might be good options to kind of promote that room and health um, with with additional fiber, um, even if you don't have the forages available to you. So let me sum up here in the last uh, last minute or so that I have. Uh, High forage diets and high production are increasingly attainable for dairy producers. There are producers out there who are achieving 70% forage and 100 pounds of milk, 
And I think we're going to see a lot more of them in the coming years. We've made huge leaps and bounds when it comes to forage quality and understanding how to feed high forage diets. And I think we're only going to get better and better at this. But again, let's shift that goal and that perspective a little bit. And let's not focus on I'm going to be 100 pounds of milk. Maybe your goal is I'm going to be six and a half pounds of solids or seven pounds of solids and, and, and focus on that component production and the pounds of fat and protein being produced, not just the pounds of milk being produced. An absolute necessity if you're going to feed a high forage diet is going to be lots of inventory and high quality. That's key. Again, you can't outfeed bad management. You need happy cows with happy rumens to make these diets work. And then you're not going to you're you're not going to maximize your success unless you're able to lower those days in milk and really get your repro protocols at the same level that you have your forage protocols. So with that, it's exactly one o'clock. It looks like I talked for exactly an hour. Um, if you have questions, I, I have time for a couple, I think. Uh, otherwise, my my number and my email address is here on your screen right now. Um, I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you all this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are. Um, and and maybe we have time for a question or two. And again, I apologize for that background noise. Thank you very much, Gail. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, folks, go, we're kind of a small number. Go ahead and unmute and just ask a question if you've got it, or you can type it in the chat box either way. Let me kind of start things off since I'm not seeing or hearing anybody come in live. Um, you know, I'm kind of old fashioned. The shaker box is a big part of starting things out for me. Tell me, are, are we getting too much fines in some of our forage? You're muted, Gail. Sorry. Uh, are we getting too much fines in some of our forage? Uh, we can. Um, that's definitely something that, uh, can be, especially on our dry hay, um, that's going to be, uh, uh, you know, the fragility of those leaves is something we think about with the alfalfa, um, and even the grass silages or the grasses sometimes, uh, you know, if you're having a lot of fines and worried about that dust or, you know, those leaves in particular are going to be where all the energy is, right. And where all the goodies are. So feeding a water, feeding, that's another advantage of feeding some of these liquid feeds like a molasses, uh, those can really help pull that ration together um, so that you're not getting that away. Um, if your question's more about uh, the, the, the PENDF, um, then, uh, sorry, I'm also watching the chat questions here and there's a couple good ones, so I'm getting a little bit distracted. If, you're, if your question's more about that physically effective fiber, um, that is something that that we do want to make sure that we're not getting too low on that physically effective fiber as well. Um, so that might be um, we think about that not as much with high forage diets, but more so with high byproduct diets. If we're feeding those high fiber byproducts, um, that is something we we tend to think about a little bit more, making sure that we have adequate PENDF in the ration. Thank you. Boy, we got some good questions that yeah. came in there. Uh, so Timothy, uh, I'll, or Timothy asked, do you have a number of, for pounds of salads per day? And I mean, that's going to depend so much on, on your goals for your herd. Uh, and are you looking at least cost? You, so I, I hesitate to give like a salad, like, boom, this is what you should be shooting for. I did kind of pull here. some just some, just some math on pounds of milk, percent fat, percent protein, and how that ties into different pounds of salads. Um, so I hesitate to give like a single number um, because I'm an extension. And so we always say it depends. Um, but here on this slide, you see some, so maybe this helps give you a little bit of an idea of some of the, some of the pounds of salads we can be shooting for at different levels of milk production and components. Uh, to Jeff's question, this is actually a really good one. Um, I hate to ask, but I actually, I love the hard question. I'm glad you asked Jeff. Um, is there any increase in methane production with these rations? And the answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> so we do know, and I think maybe where Jeff's coming from on this, we do know that um, fiber digestion produces 
methane. But um, I'm a little bit more of a stickler lately on not just looking at how much methane is that cow belching, but what is that doing to the, to the system as a whole? And I don't, and it really depends a lot on, um, it depends a lot <laughs> on the system that you're working with. So if you're using uh, cover crops, for example, on, uh, on these high forage, as part of a high forage ration, or if you're not even feeding your cover crops, you know, you're just using them more for soil management, um that extra carbon sequestration you get out of the cover crops to some extent may actually counteract uh some of the the methane you use triticale oh i don't know about oh so um are you feeding triticale or are you i assume you're feeding it yeah so some of that triticale that you're some of that benefit that you're getting in carbon sequestration from from using that triticale is going to counteract some of the additional methane that you get uh from the cow herself um the other thing that i think is kind of going back to the pounds of i'm going to get off on a tangent here if i'm not careful um the other thing that i think we need to think about when we're talking about methane production and the footprint of uh footprint of our herds is shipping uh and how are we are we and i'm glad i'm on this slide right now it kind of ties back into timothy's question so if i'm shipping six and a half pounds of solids here on 100 pounds of milk that's more water that's a higher water footprint that's also increased shipping there's methane and emissions associated with shipping however if i'm more at this 88 pounds in same pounds of solids that's going to be uh that's going to have a less of a footprint on down the line um so it's a very complicated question generally speaking yes as we feed more fiber you're going to get more methane production from cows but I think if you look at the system as a whole and the other footprint, uh, the other ways that it can be impacted, and I don't have hard numbers to back this up, but you're going to counteract some of that by having improved longevity. You're going to have to raise fewer replacements to be able to, to um, replace those cows in the herd if they live longer. Um, the, the improved efficiency. Uh, some, so a lot of these things really tie back in um, and kind of, it makes it a lot more nuanced question um, than it might be like, yes, if we put, if we put forage in a fermenter in vitro, we measure more methane production. So I hope that answers your question. It was kind of a long response. Um, yeah, so that, Jim, I think that's great. Seven pounds uh, combined fat and protein for Holsteins and six and a half for jerseys. Um, so, so thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Jim. Now, let's kind of go back to that the breed question there. I'm going to twist it kind of out of context a little bit. But uh, one breed or the other going to be more useful as we crank up this forage or adapt to it better? I don't know. Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to be late for class. So I'm texting a student real quick. Um, I don't know, and I'm curious if anybody else on the call, I'm kind of scrolling through seeing a few um, familiar names here. So I don't know if anybody else has more experience with that. Um, the, the which breeds are more efficient or less efficient at, at uh, utilizing high forage diets. Um, jerseys, we generally say are more efficient in general, um, but of course they have smaller body size. Um, I actually don't know relative to, I would think just picturing a Jersey and a Holstein side by side that they might have more room and volume per pound of body weight, but I actually am not sure on that. I'm just pulling that out of thin air. Um, so I'm curious if anybody else on the call has any experience with that. Um, but otherwise I don't know if I have a good answer to your question. Okay, we've got uh, some more questions and comments coming in uh we appreciate uh these uh additions to the program uh have you got time for one more closing comment and then we'll have to shut down yeah i really appreciate what jim uh paulson left here as well another measure of efficiency is pounds of salad per pounds of uh digestible ndf um 
so yeah, we tend to let kind of look at dry matter as as a its own thing, but but we're getting so much more nuance on how we look at what's in that dry matter too. Um, and and yeah, really focusing on those pounds of solids, not just volume of milk, but pounds of solids there, uh, and the pounds of of uh, digestible NDF or or pounds of NDF that's actually uh, used up in that cow. So I appreciate that comment, Jim. Thank you. Again. Dr. Carpenter, thank you very much for your presentation today. I'd like to remind everybody that they can contact her via our website uh, and get you know, a direct answer to an email question. Uh, I also uh, will be sending out a, a email that has a uh, evaluation as well as uh, the link for the archive. Uh, program from today. Uh, my final comment is on March 9th, uh, we will be having our I-29 Mu University uh, webinar on dry off can be more than just dry cow therapy. So we thank everybody for uh, being on with us and we appreciate the, uh, the comments and the, the conversation. Uh, Gail, everybody, I'll be signing off. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, everybody.